We have some re required reading for you in order to complete the course. This is in the form of a book called The Fundamentals of Management, Essential Concepts and Applications. The contents of this book will build upon all the knowledge you learn in this particular course. We also have some indicative reading or some recommended reading and this list, this list of books covers theories like organisational leadership, organisational behaviour and also goes into the practices of leadership and management. So you can delve deeper into the topics that you find the most interesting throughout this course. Let's go through the list of modules that are covered in this course. So the first module or session is talking about the concepts and theories of management. So we dive into the history of how the theory of management has developed. Session two looks at different management styles. So there are very different ways of managing and leading organizations and teams. We'll delve into what each of these are and why each of them are useful on their own. Session three looks at team assessment. So how do you compile a team? What creates a team? And how can you help a team work together effectively to achieve your organizational goals? Session four goes into motivation and empowerment. So how do you motivate and empower your teams to work towards the goals of the organization and their individual goals? Session five looks at groups and teams. So what is the difference between a group and a team? When do each work well and in which environment? Session six looks at communications and conflict resolution. So how do you as a leader communicate well and how do you resolve conflict that occurs in your organization? Session seven will look at power and influence. So how do you use your power and your influence at its best? And what happens when you have too much power and too much influence? What are the negative sides of that? Session eight looks at team leadership. How do you lead a team to achieve the organization's goals? Session nine looks at coaching and mentoring. So what is the difference between the two and how can each theory be applied in order to get the most out of your team? And session 10 looks at decision making and problem solving. So we'll present you with a few different models you can use to effectively solve problems. In this module, we will be covering the theories of management. Here we have two definitions of management. Let's read through each of them and see if you can spot the similarities between the two. So the first definition is the attainment of organisational goals in an effective and efficient manner through planning, organising, leading and controlling. The second definition is the process of, of administering and coordinating resources effectively and efficiently in an effort to achieve the goals of the organisation. So what do you think are the similarities between the two? Have a think about that. There are some key terms in the definition that you really need to understand. The first thing is effectiveness, the degree to which goals are achieved, or in other words, doing the right thing. The next key term is efficiency. So how can you use the fewest inputs, things like money, people, technology, time, to generate the output that you want? The fourth key term is organisation. So what is an organisation? It's a social entity that is goal directed and deliberately structured, whether it's for profit or not for profit. And the final key term to understand is performance. This is the ability of an organisation to achieve its goals through using its resources effectively and efficiently. Let's now look at the historical background of management. So ancient management came in the form of the Egyptian pyramids, the Great Wall of China, and the floating warship assembly, assembly lines of the Venetians. So with the Venetians, this was one of the earliest large-scale industrial enterprises in history. This arsenal was responsible for the bulk of the Venetian Republic's naval power. The Great Wall of China, the building of the Great Wall of China, began as early as the 1600s or the 7th century. When you think about the building of the Egyptian pyramids, the Great Wall of China, and what the Venetians were achieving, can you imagine the amount of energy, power, and influence it took from the leader or leaders in order to make those projects come to life? Adam Smith published a book called The Wealth of Nations in 1776, and this was one of the first descriptions of, to look at what builds the wealth of a nation, including the division of labour, productivity and free markets. So that's a little bit of the historical background of management. Let's now look at the major approaches to management. We've already looked at the historical background 
classical approaches are theories and concepts on, on analysis that synthesizes workflows. And the main objective of classical approaches to management theory is to improve economic efficiency and especially in labor. So effectively, how do we make labor or people more productive? The next approach to management is the quantitative approach. The quantitative approach uses statistics and computer simulations in order to improve decision making. In other words, how can we use numbers to make better decisions? The next approach to management is a behavioral approach, and this is more like the human relations movement. So behavioral theorists believe that a better understanding of human behavior at work the looking at motivation and conflict and group dynamics actually leads to an improvement in productivity. So it makes organizations more effective through looking at how people work together. And the final contemporary approach includes socio-technical theory of organizational behavior and effectively redesigning tasks to optimize operations and new technology while still preserving interpersonal skills and the other human aspects of them. So contemporary approaches of management to management effectively build on the previous four approaches that came before it. Another key theorist in the history of management is Frederick Winslow Taylor. He's known as the father of scientific management and he published a book called The Principles of Scientific Management back in 1911. And he believed that there is one best way to do a job and one best person to do that job. He was very much focused on efficiency and studying people and he firmly believed that management should be an academic discipline. And his work was so influential that he actually was influenced bringing psychology into the workplace and even Gantt charts used in planning, which every single project plan in the modern world now uses a Gantt chart. His basic principles were to look at the scientific side of management. So the first one is to create a science for each part of an individual's work so that you can measure it, you can look at it analytically, and it replaces the old rule of thumb method of working. The second key principle that Taylor talked about is to scientifically select to train and to teach and develop each individual worker. So to give them a theory in, in, ter in terms of selecting them, but also then develop developing them further in their work. The third management principle that Taylor presented to us was to cooperate with your workers so that everything they do is done in accordance with the principles of the science that it's been developed in. And finally, the fourth principle that Taylor gave was to divide the work and responsibility almost equally between the managers and their workers, but also focus on managers doing the work that specifies to them rather than the workers that they're managing. Now, Henry Fayol, or Henri Fayol, which is his French pronunciation of his name, he's a French uh, professor and theorist, his work on the general administrative theory is something we will look at in more detail later on in this module. Um, in theory he has, or in overall he has, 14 principles that will apply to even modern day business, let alone the business that he was dealing with back in his day. And we'll look at Henry Fyle's theory in a bit more detail, as I said, towards the later end of this module. Another prominent theorist that we'd like you to be aware of is Max Weber. Now, he developed a theory of authority based on an ideal type of organization, and he effectively emphasized that rationality, predictability, impersonality, technical competence, and authoritarianism is what is used to best run an organization. Effectively, Henri Fayol was the father of the modern operational management theory. The three major contributions he made to the theory of management is first, to have a clear distinction between technical and managerial skills. Second, to identify functions that constitute the management process. And third, to develop the principles of management. So when it comes to the first one, having a clear distinction between technical and managerial skills, what do you think are the differences between what is a technical skill and what is a managerial skill? Are there differences? Are both technical and managerial skills effectively the same thing? 
Now, Fayol gave us the 14 principles of management, and we'll go through each of them very briefly now. We actually have some notes towards the end of this module where we look at these 14 principles in more detail. But in, at a high level, the first principle is a division of work. So how do you divide work between all the different individuals working in the organisation? The second is authority. So who has authority and what do they have authority over? The third is discipline. So how do you implement discipline within your organisation? The fourth is a unity of command, which effectively holds employees accountable to one person. The military or the government are typically run through using the unity of command. Then you have the unity of direction, which effectively is having one leader with one plan to reach an overall objective. The sixth is the subordination of individual interest, the general interest. This means that the individuals in an organization put their personal interests aside in order to then build up and work towards the objectives and interests of the organization as a whole. The seventh principle is remuneration. So how are individuals compensated for the work they do for the organisation? The eighth principle is centralisation, which gives the top managers the authority to make decisions. The ninth principle is a scalar chain, which is a formalised line of authority where you go from the highest to the lowest and there is the flow of information flows like that as well. The 11th principle is equity, so there's no discrimination against race, sex and religion or any other factors when you come to employ a person in a role. Number 12 is the stability of tenure of personnel. So the focus of an organisation is to decrease the amount of attrition and to retain the, the talented employees over the long term. Number 13 is initiative, so individual employees and their ideas and their experiences and their methods are given importance so that they can add towards the larger organisation and its goals. And the 14th principle is the esprit de corps, which is team spirit. So you need to keep team spirit alive in order to achieve the goals of the organisation, both effectively and efficiently. Now, according to Fayol, the activities of an industrial enterprise or an organisation can be grouped into six categories. Let's go through each of them now. The first one is technical, which looks at the production and operational side of the business. So how do you do what you do? How do you achieve the output? The second one is commercial. So this is looking at how you buy, how you sell and how you exchange things for money or other benefits. The third is financial, so how do you best use the money you have as an organisation to achieve your goals? The fourth is security, how do you protect your assets and your resources, which includes your people, your buildings, your technical um, infrastructure? The fifth is accounting, so how do you determine your accounting, your financial position? So how do you implement your balance sheets? How do you make sure you have enough cash flow and that kind of thing? And the sixth is managerial. So how do you use the resources you have to the best of your ability to achieve the best of the results that you set yourself to achieve? Max Weber, who we saw earlier, is a German theorist and sociologist. He actually followed the general administrative theory of Henri Fayol, and he created his own theory, which effectively is based on the concept of bureaucratic organisations. Now, where Weber's theory came from is that during the 1800s, most organisations in Europe were managed on a personal, family-like basis. So the employees were loyal towards one single individual and the resources were used to re realise the desires of this individual. So this one person would make a plan and the plan would be implemented and this one person would be both um, accountable and the people will be loyal to this one person. But Viva realised that actually a better way or a more effective and efficient way to manage an organisation is to add a level of rationality and impersonality and that's what he termed bureaucracy. The main char characteristics of bureaucracy is that organisations are based on rational authority and when they're like this they are more efficient and they're more adaptable to changes. 
the promotion of employees is based on their competence and technical qualifications, not who they are, but what they can do. There are rules and regulations in place that govern the organization. There's a clear division of labor. The organization has a clear hierarchy and the managers don't lead based on their personality, but they have a way of managing that is more technical and they are giving orders rather than relying on their position or their weight influence in order to get things done. So continuing on with this theory, the ideal bureaucracy according to Weber meant that managers were also subject to rules and procedures. The positions were organized in the hierarchy of the organization. You would select people to either join the organization or be promoted based on their technical qualifications. All decisions were recorded in writing so they could be followed up and they were recorded efficiently. The, the separation between what's management and what's ownership, so who owned the organization wasn't there to manage the people running it. So there was a very clear division of labor. So delving a little bit deeper into Weber's theory of bureaucracy basically meant that man managers are career professionals and not owners of the unit they manage. So effectively, you would be recruiting somebody to become a manager based on their technical competencies to manage people. There's a uniform application of rules and controls. So the rules and controls that you set apply to everyone. They don't apply to some people and not apply to others based on their personality or their position. All jobs are broken down into very simple, very routine, and very well-defined tasks. So anybody with a technical skill of a certain level can come in and, and, and do that job because it was, it was well-defined and all the tasks that it takes to complete the job. The hierarchy was well-organized, so there is a very clear chain of command, and there is a system of written rules and standard operating procedures. So when you think about business today, how well is Weber's theory of bureaucracy applied to business administration and management in the modern world? We touched briefly on the quantitative approach to management earlier. Let's look at it in a bit more detail now. So the quantitative approach to, to managerial uh, leadership looks at using numbers and statistical methods to make a decision. And it actually was developed during the Second World War, where the logistics of the um, attacks that were being made, how the army was organized, um, how the, uh, you know, the size of the convoys, how bombing raids would be either done or decided to be done, was all based on numbers to make sure that we can back up our decision based on the numbers that we have used. So the focus of the quantitative approach to management is to improve the decisions made by managers by applying um, statistics, information models, and computer simulations. And actually today, when this type of decision making is, is all done by computers, we don't have humans printing out sheets of numbers and making decisions anymore. When you think about organizational behavior, would you say that people are the most important asset of an organization or not? The Hawthorne studies were a series of experiments that were conducted in the late 1920s and early 1930s by a company called Western Electric. And the idea was that workers will respond better if they have better working conditions, for example, if we give them better lighting, they're likely to be more productive. Whereas the findings that came about after the experiment would, experiments were done in a factory were actually more surprising. The researchers found that productivity increased unexpectedly under imposed adverse working conditions. And people responded better, as in they become more productive, when they had attention from their managers. So no matter how well the environment they're in is created, they actually become more productive when they're being observed or when they know that somebody is watching them and expecting a result. So effectively, the Hawthorne studies concluded that people become more effective and more um, productive when they have a certain social norm Group, group standards and their attitudes, and that actually influences how productive they are more so than the environment they're in. And that's now known as the Hawthorne effect. 
Another theory of management by McFarland talks about how management is actually a process. So it's a process by which managers create, direct, maintain and operate purposive organisations through systematic, coordinated and cooperative human efforts. The important thing to see here is the word process. It basically tells us that management is ongoing, it's not a one-time thing and it, and it covers a large span of time. And the dynamic nature of this or the ever-changing nature of this means that in, when you're managing an organisation, managers create changes and adopt organisations to those changes by implementing the changes successfully. And businesses, according to McFarland, will fail and become bankrupt because managers are not able to cope with the change or support their organisation to, to and towards and throughout that change. So when we look at the management process theory, we look at the fact that there are some key fundamentals of management that lead into reaching the organization's goals and missions. So you need to plan effectively, whether that's planning your resource, planning your projects, then you organize them. So you organize your people, you organize your resources, you organize your timing, you lead people towards the goal of the organization and you allow everyone to collaborate in order to achieve the goals the organization is set to achieve. There are three theorists called Denali, Gibson and Ivanchevich. They also support the view that management is a process, but their stress is more on coordination. So they believe that management is a process by which individual and group effort is coordinated towards group goals. So that means that to achieve the goals that you want to achieve in your organisation, you must coordinate the activity of management, but they need to be securing and maintaining this organisation. So the responsibility of coordination is on the management team. A different theory of management by Don Stevens and Kelly actually say that management is a function rather than a process. So their belief is that in management there are a set of roles which include duties, responsibilities and relationships involved in an organisation and these duties and responsibilities are the function of a manager. So they perform those managers they perform their managerial tasks on a daily basis and what they do is very different to what their employees do. Which effectively means that management is getting things done through other people. So the manager doesn't do anything apart from motivate other people to get the job done. So according to this theory, the key objectives of management is to use the resources that they have, improve the performance of the individuals, get the best talent and make the most of their best talent and plan for the future. Let's now look at some nature and characteristics of management. So management is multidisciplinary, so you need many different skills in order to manage people. It's a group activity, so a manager will need to manage a group of people. There is a goal associated with it, so you are, you are managing people to achieve that goal. It's a factor of production and it's a universal character which basically means that it's a, there's a system of authority, the function is quite dynamic, it can be an art as well as a science, and management is most definitely a profession that exists within a social hierarchy. Let's now look at the scope of management. So how far does the role of management stretch? So in terms of the activities, managers are involved in planning the work, making sure there's enough staff or people there to do the work, coordinating all the duties and responsibilities, organising the tasks and the people and the resources, directing people towards the goal we need to achieve and controlling them to a degree so that everybody stays within their realm of their role and their responsibilities. But on the operational side, you also have different levels of management. So you have management in productions and operations, management within finance, within marketing, within personnel or HR, managers of the office and managers of systems. So the scope of management, as you can see, goes across the entire organisation. So we look briefly at the various functions of management and these are effectively planning and organising the resources and people in order to direct them towards a goal that you want to achieve as an organisation. Let's have a look at these functions in detail. So on the planning side, you basically decide what is to be done, when will it be done by, how will we do it, and who will do what. 
On the organising side, you effectively identify and classify and assign all the activities needed to achieve the goal. You delegate the authority and you coordinate the relationships between each of the teams. On the staffing side, this is looking at, let's plan our resources in terms of people and see when we need to hire more people, when we need to move people around, what do we do in terms of recruitment, how do we select people for a role, how do we develop them in their roles and promote them, how do we coordinate, conduct the appraisals and how do we pay them or remunerate them for the work that they're doing. On the directing side, this involves leading, communicating, motivating and supervising. Coordination, number five, will look at the ordering and arrangement of all the tasks and effort. So how can we unify the actions and coordinate them, make them work together in order to achieve a common goal? On the controlling side, this is more about establishing standards, how you manage performance, comparing what's actually happening to the standard you've set yourself, seeing what gaps are between the two and taking corrective action so that the people are working well together and they're working efficiently and effectively. There are different functions in management and there's a difference between what's administrative and what's managerial. So when it comes to the nature of work, the administration is concerned about the achievement of, obje of objectives and major policies in an organisation, but management will put the actions will put these policies into action. So the administra administration will lay down the plans, management will make the plans happen. In terms of the type of function, administration is more, is more determinative, so they create the vision, and management is more executional, so it will make the vision happen. In the administration, the status is effectively the person who owns or invests the capital. So this is the CEO or the owner, and sometimes the other stakeholders will be the investors in the organization or the shareholders. And in management, the nature of the status of these people is they are a group of people who manage other people in the organization and they have a specialist knowledge in order to fulfill the tasks the organization has set itself through the people that are there. A administration style of management is mainly used in the government, in military and in educational enterprises and management itself is typically used in most business that are profit and non-profit enterprises. The decision making of administration is influenced by public opinion, by government policies and social and religious factors. But the decisions made by management are based on the values and the objectives of the organisation they're working for. So they don't have a lot of outside influence when it comes to decision making. Let's, start, let's now look at Henry Fayol's 14 principles of management. The first one is, is the division of work. So this is basically saying that when tasks are evenly distributed, to qualified and competent people, this results in more efficiency. The second of Fayol's principles is authority. So formal authority is given to managers, so they have the right to command and give orders to their subordinates or people in their team. The third principle is discipline. So every member of the organisation has to respect the rules that the organisation has, and nobody is given favourable treatment to not respect those rules. The fourth is a unity of command. So this holds employees accountable to one person and you report to one manager who will be able to resolve any conflict or it means that there's no confusion of authority. The fifth is a unity of direction. So there is one leader with one plan to reach an objective. So you wouldn't have two people that you report to in an organisation, you always have one leader. The sixth is subordination of the, in, subordination of the individual interests to the general interests, which basically means that when individual employees work for a company, they put their own interests aside in order to achieve the goals and interests of the organisation they work for. 
The seventh principle is remuneration. In other words, what compensation do people receive for the work that they've done? And sometimes this isn't just in the form of money. So can you think of other ways an individual can be remunerated or paid for the work that they do? The eighth is centralization. This effectively means that you decrease the role of the subordinates or the team members in decision making and managers actually retain the final responsibility, but you also give the subordinates or the workers enough authority to do their job properly. So they're not constantly going to the managers to make decisions. They do have authority within their own circle of influence to make decisions. The scalar chain is a line of authority that runs from the highest to the lowest ranking individual and the flow information goes from top to bottom as well. Number 10 is order. So in order to um, use your resources well, you have to place all your resources in the right, right place at the right time. So people should be placed in the jobs their skills are best suited to. Number 11 of the 11th principle is equity. So this is effectively not discriminating against people based on their gender, their sexual orientation, their socioeconomic background, their religion. And it basically means you treat people fairly in accordance to the skills that they have. The 12th principle is the stability of staff. So this idea is that you will suffer as an organization, not be effective or efficient if you keep losing people. So you have to keep your attrition of staff as low as possible and maintain the talent that you've hired. The 13, number 13 of the 13th principle is initiative. And this is looking at giving the employees some authority in order to become more creative. So the idea here is that your employees are intelligent and you must give them some freedom for initiative in order to, to achieve the organizational goals better. The 14 is number 14 of the 14th uh, principle is team spirit. And effectively teamwork is very important in an organization. And when people work in teams, and they have open communication, they feel like they work in an environment of openness and trust, this encourages more teamwork and encourages the organization to be more efficient and more effective. And that brings us to the end of this module on the theory of management.